Hey, Poisanos, Joseph A. Sabora here, and Mamma Mia, I'm going to be tearing apart the zestful and travesty of a live-action abomination based on the popular games from Nintendo that's totally a ba bomb I'm talking about Super Mario Brothers with the two Brooklyn Plumbers Mario and Luigi, both played by a British actor, Bob Hoskins, along with a Latin actor, John Leguizamo, portraying as Italian-American plumbers, who are about to rescue a paleologist named Princess Daisy, played by Samantha Mathis, from a dystopian parallel universe, called Dino Hatton, a very nasty, fungus uh, metropolis world that's being run by Mr. President Koopa, who's played by Dennis Hopper. <sighs> and yes, it really, really sucks. And indeed it does. <laughs> yep, and I'm actually reviewing this sucker. Which, you know, prior to the new the Super Mario Bros. movie that we just got. And I just reviewed it uh, this week. Even though I had an awesome time seeing it with my sister Eileen. Who of course is a video game fan herself coming from my brother Jason because I know she has all of of the other video game consoles from Nintendo and Xbox alone yes and she has um, the Wii, the Wii U, GameCube um, I think we might still have the Nintendo 64 so I'm not so sure but she also has the Super Nintendo though and, of course, she has the Nintendo Switch. And she is definitely a huge Mario fan herself, too. Exactly, we got it from Jason, and yours truly. But, for me, I became a movie fan and all that. And, even though I love video games, and I was a Mario fan, and I could still be, um... Of course, I'm a Peanuts fan and all that stuff. Well, I wish I could play video games more often too, but I basically had to be busy doing all this other stuff. Like doing reviews and, and other random videos and all that. And you know, just trying to make this channel even better. But nevertheless, I mean, that particular Saturday we had an awesome time, and this was exactly what I could have remember having 30 years ago. Because heaven forbid, this movie came out on May 28th, 1993. Even though 93 was a great year, though, because there were a lot of great films that came out, especially Jurassic Park, since we were into Dino Fever at this point on. How about uh, The Sandlots? How about My Neighbor Totoro? Even though that came, that was made in 1988 and came out in Japan, but it was released here in North America that year. Um, then there's other great films like Schindler's List, or even the, um, like uh, other films like um, Rookie of the Year. Um, I actually did enjoy Last Action Hero, Guilty Pleasure, but that's that's fine. I mean, it's a fun act, action movie. Uh, there's In the Line of Fire. There's um, Searching for Bobby Fischer. There was uh, Homeward Bound, The Incredible Journey. And um, so many others that came out that year. Anything that's better than than Super Mario Brothers movie. Oh, and that also includes Hocus Pocus, too. 
Don't want to forget that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there. Oh, yeah, and The Nightmare Before Christmas, uh, Cool Runnings, Free Musketeers, uh, Batman, Master of the Phantasm. Yeah, those movies, too. A lot of them. A lot of movies that came out that year. They are way better than this. And I mean way, way better. And I don't care about Free Willy. But I do love um, Dennis the Menace. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then there's The Secret Garden and, and all these other ones. Again, a lot of movies to list. And The Good Son sucks, too. Still does. Okay. <laughs> well, I definitely want to experience my horrible time when I went to see this movie at eight years old. Because I can't believe this movie became a noble defender for you know, thanks to the internet and anybody else I think for those who grew up seeing this terrible film um, during their childhood days and they and they thought to themselves oh it's not that bad you know so on and so forth that they had to say and they thought oh it, it actually respects the games my ass I know I mean, I respect their opinions. I mean, everything's subjective these days. It's understandable. But at least truer Mario fans have common sense. And I have common sense as well. So apparently the sad, but what's sad about it is that we were very excited for this because it was the first time. I mean, come on, this was like after the Super Mario Butter Super Show, which was their first live action blending in with animation, you know, for the show itself. But they had their live action segments with Captain Lou Albino and Danny Wells, and trust me, they knew how to play the roles just right. And they knew exactly what they're going through, even though they are indeed living in Brooklyn, you know, doing their plumbing business. And meeting all the celebrities and all that, yeah. I do wish Shell Factory had did a little better with their DVD releases, but I know it's it's not their fault, really. It's it's basically the music clearance licensing deal that's going around that they couldn't accept anything too much for their set alone. In fact, uh, it got reissued by In Circle Entertainment, but all they kept was just the animated series on its own. It doesn't make any sense because that's the reason why they call it the Super Show. Because they blend in with both live action and animation together. And it's it's fun, you know. And I guess I also forgot to mention that I well I don't have the uh, the other Mario series that I really wish I can get, and I hope I will. Maybe I might get it on Amazon if I get a chance. Uh, of the Adventures of Super Mario Bros. 3 and indeed the Super Mario World. So I hope I can get those later. Well, another thing I forgot to mention, and I'm going to say it right away there actually was an anime in 1986, just the same year that. Super Mario Bros. debut on Nintendo NES system, or simply Nintendo, <laughs> whatever. But there's actually an anime that came out in Japan in 1986 where we get to see the Mario Brothers, you know, that ends up going straight into a parallel universe, and that's, or at this rate, um, that's where we get to see Princess Peach, and they're about to save her from the evil King Koopa. And it's only an hour, by the way. It's, I mean, it's rather short, but but it looks rather well made for 1986. 
So this could have been the very first um, animated feature that they ever got. Uh, and I know they did a fan dub of it too. Um, it, you can find it on YouTube. Um, there's a 4K uh, restoration of it. And there's the fan dub available. And yes, the, the 4K restoration is indeed in Japanese with English subtitles. So trust me on this one. It's a lot better than this live action cesspool that we got. Yeah, if anything. Okay, now I'm going to explain my horrible experience. Well, it was during Memorial Day weekend because we had no class on Monday. You know, we just wanted to, you know, spend some time with the family, just have fun. In fact, I'm probably going to say this, but originally I was going to see the movie with my aunt, Anna, because I thought maybe we could just, you know, hang around. We were going to the mall, you know, go shopping here and there. And then I thought maybe afterwards we'd go see the movie. Like we're probably going to go see it, like maybe at the Eagle Rock Plaza or something, if they were playing it over there. Or maybe if they're playing at General Cinema in Glendale. I mean, whatever feeder it's playing to that. But unfortunately, though, um, I think we spent way too much time during that particular Friday, so I, I couldn't be able to go. So that's a shame. And at that point on, she did pick me up, too, you know, from school. Yeah. Kind of a waste. And then um, on Saturday, I thought maybe, maybe there'll be a much better day for sure so of course I was still staying at grandma's house and Louie was there and all that and I thought okay maybe Louie will take me to see the film and see what happens uh, no such luck <laughs> we were basically just you know doing other things I think we were renting movies or something like that so the only uh, plan for sure was, of course, because I had to beg my parents to see this movie so bad. Well, I had no other option but to take my mom and my dad to see this movie, joining in with my brother Jason. Uh, whereas my sister, because she barely, um, she's almost about to turn a year old. Yeah, she was still a baby. She had to stay at Grandma's house, of course, just to take care of You know, I was a precocious uh, eight-year-old, and my brother was only seven. So, of course, we are big Mario fans at the time, you know, because we had the Nintendo system, and we play all the Mario games. We actually had Dr. Mario, by the way, too. That was another thing I, I would forgot to mention, too, was... Yeah, Dr. Mario was another cool game we had. But mostly we did have Super Mario Brothers, as, as we speak. We were getting ready to go see the movie right away. Um, unfortunately, though, our car, my mom's car broke down. And, yes, it was my mom's car, which was the Ford Temple, which I know my dad drives it as well. And they had to get some repairs, so the only thing we had to go, we had to go see it in Burbank. So at that point on, we had to take the bus all the way through just to get there, so that way we don't we don't show up very late into the, the showing, because uh, we were about to go see the movie in the afternoon, or at this rate, I think in the evening times, because the, uh, I think, if I can remember... It was going to start at around, I think, 5 or 5.30 or something. Yeah, because we did left uh, in the afternoon for sure. And we finally made it there. But little did we know, we did actually show up pretty late. I can't believe it. Uh, and then if that, was, and if that wasn't the case, I mean, I knew this was going to happen because 
when we go see a movie sometimes, my dad can be overcritical. I mean, it's, it's, he's basically his own... He has his own psyche right here. Like, he's basically acting like he's a film critic. So he, he knows that when we ever see a movie like this, I have a feeling he's going to say something awful. Like, he knows that he's going to be watching a very bad film. So I knew this was going to happen. Because we actually did want to see a bad film um, a year ago before this called Cool World. And even though we saw that on my brother's birthday, yeah, because he turned seven at the time, my mom walked out. She hated this movie so much because it had no plot. I mean, I knew exactly what, what this movie was going to go for. A uh, who, uh, who Framed Roger Abbott for sex because of the creator and director behind this movie. It's not other than Ralph Boschke who, of course, had done some adult animated features and blend in with live action as well, sometimes. So, Kuro was not the first to do so, even though it's only PG-13. I mean, he has done a lot of this stuff. I mean, come on, this is the man who gave us Fritz the Cat. All adult animated uh, features that he's done. But he also had done some great work, like Wizards and American Pop come to mind. Yeah. All right. Now, I guess it seems rather interesting, too, because since we're seeing this movie, was that, of course, you got Bob Hoskins from Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Once again, I'm mentioning that. And John Leguizamo was just a relatively unknown at the time, even though he was doing some of his earlier work. Mostly um, uh, movies with, that was directed by Brian De Palma, like for example, he actually had an appearance in the movie called Castle Tees of War, and I think that's probably how he got the role of in the movie Khalil's Way, which I'm very surprised too because in Khalil's Way, because he's about to take over Khalil's business later on, like he's going to end up like him. I find it funny though because he had a mustache in that film. How come they didn't give him a mustache in Super Mario Brothers? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And while they can both pull off um, their authentic Italian accent for sure, because they, they definitely do sound Italian in a way. I, I guess in some cases or another, they probably would have done a lot better. I mean, even though they were wearing the overalls and they're matching their own colors, you know, Mario's red and, and Luigi is green, but if you had to go back to the game, you know exactly what they look like. I mean, you know, one is small, the other one's tall, you know, one has uh, baby belly fat, the other one is rather skinny. And they all wear their tool belts, all the equipment that they have in their own truck. <laughs> and yes, they wear their old walls, um, matching colors, and even has on the hats um, the symbol for, for their names. Yeah, Mario has the M, Luigi has the L, and they team up together. And they care for one another as brothers, so they stick together. You know, try to fix all the plum, all the plumbing problems around. Yeah, and that's what makes it a great team. But they could have done better for this film, sadly. And it was real, and even for Samantha Mathis, because I know she's a great and surprisingly underrated actress too. I mean, because already with Fern Gully and Pump of the Brian, those movies, it really captivates her to be an excellent actress, but I do wish she can do better here. I mean, it's not her fault, though, granted. It's just, at least she's being, at least she's being portrayed exactly what we expected for Daisy. 
I mean, I know they couldn't get Princess Peach nor Toadstool in this one, and and now they have to go for something more metropolistic and all this other fungus sides and a lot of funguses around. Fungi. <laughs> Trust the fungus. <laughs> My God. And then we do get some of the mushrooms, but that's not enough. So it's like you get some of those surprises in the fungus, which is the mushrooms and the and the bomb, the tiny, but specifically bomb that they got. Oh wow. Okay. Well, we showed up late. We only missed like, and it turns out that we missed 12 minutes of it. Um, from the beginning, which was basically, we, we got in, it was at the scene where um, where we have both uh, Mario and Luigi with Daisy and and Mario's girlfriend, um, Danella. And they're just eating at, at this Italian restaurant. So this is before we get to see what happens next. So I guess if we didn't miss quite a thing as far as I'm concerned. But I think the only thing we did miss out, because I had to see this movie again when it was on TV, was indeed um, both uh, Mario and Luigi's uh, plumbing business that's been, you know, in a competition with Scapelli's plumbing. Yeah. And not, and not to mention the story at the beginning where, you know, we learned about, um, about how Daisy was born. Well, okay, I'm going to explain all that once we get to it. <sighs> well, after seeing the movie at the time in theaters, I felt pretty bad. Because, one, I dragged my parents into this. I was very excited because, after all, we want to have a great time during this particular weekend. And two, I knew Dad was going to get overcritical for this mess, and and I was right. Um, three, I barely got mad at them because they made me miss the first half of the film, almost, but which was only just 12 minutes. And then four, I felt like a fucking idiot. Yes, I'm going to curse on this one. But I, I felt like an idiot. I felt totally regret for myself having to see this mess. I, I felt totally disappointed because this is exactly why I could have had what it should have been exactly what the story portrayed it. I mean, it really did insult to my intelligence, even as an eight-year-old. But having to see it again, I, I figured maybe I, I want to see how everything went. And, and maybe I, I, I could have thought of changing my mind at first, but no, no, no such luck. This was really terrible. I mean, they, they obviously didn't, they didn't do the research properly enough. Uh, it didn't, they didn't do any uh, justice to the source material whatsoever. Um, they could have done a lot of justice to the characters as well, not to mention wasted talents of all these great actors that they got to play the roles and this is the best they can do i mean that sucks i mean it just feels so cheap and to think we had to see this uh, for about five bucks i believe yeah and that was a waste Waste of money. And I'm glad it bombed. Ba bomb. <laughs> yes, ba bomb. At the box office for sure, and rightly deserved. You know what I should have went to see instead of this movie if I knew this was going to be bad, even though I didn't know it was going to be. I should have went to see Cliffhanger, that same year. I sh in fact I should have saw that movie instead. With Sylvester Stallone. Because I guarantee you that movie. Yes. That's another film I forgot to mention to say. Cliffhanger is a way better film than this. It had more action. 
than ever before. I mean, sure, maybe it doesn't have much of a story, or it probably does have a story, but it's certainly better than... I mean, it is basically a diehard clone, but set in the Rocky Mountains, but at least it kicks more ass than this movie ever would. I mean, sure, it's an R-rated film, but I still would rather see that at a young age. I mean, it's an awesome movie. So that was my utter big regression of not seeing that. Or I could have saw my neighbor Totoro again. I mean, seeing it the second time would be even better. Even for Memorial Day weekend, but I probably would, would see, like, maybe another film to join. I mean, come on, man. I mean, we deserve better than this. Mario fans deserve better than this. And that's exactly what, why we got stuck with this. All this time. I mean, Nintendo hasn't done a live-action film until Detective... Yeah, Pokemon Detective Pikachu, which came out in 2019. Yes, and, I, and I'm glad we got that for sure. But at least we, we now have a CGI animated feature that works so well. And they did the research, and they got the creator to produce this. And had a helping hand. We got everything that went into. Yeah, the only critical thing that they had to say was about Chris Platt and Charlie Day's casting as Mario and Luigi. But you know what? They did better than than ever. I mean, it could have been worse. But I'm glad it's not worse. And I guess most of all, there wasn't even a single bad scene in that film compared to this movie because this movie that I'm reviewing is a travesty there's not even a single good scene in this movie whatsoever oh boy <laughs> and I still feel pretty bad about it and they were about to force me into changing my mind too um, when I was on Facebook and and on YouTube for sure and I'm like dream on that's never gonna happen not even at the age of 37 and a half um, almost turning 38 right now well I'm gonna be 38 on May 2nd of this year no way no how I'm gonna keep my common sense and say that this movie can kiss my ass that's for sure I know I'm 28 minutes in I'm, I'm already wasting my time but let's just get over it with this stupid review it stars Bob Hoskins John Leguizamo Dennis Hopper Samantha Mathis Fisher Stevens I can't believe Fisher Stevens was in this mess because the same year he was in a short-lived series called Key West. But not only that, he was in Short Circuit 1 and 2 as the creator of, of Johnny Five. Yeah, Ben. He was also... Oh, and here's an interesting surprise. Uh, both Fisher Stevens and Dennis Hopper were both in the movie My Science Project. That was like eight years prior to this piece of crap. What do you know? That almost seems like a reunion in a way. Because Hopper played uh, their teacher. And he was a high school student. Which basically he's like a badass type. <laughs> God, even my science project is a way better film than this. Anyway, <laughs> okay, enough of this. Uh, Richard Edson, Verona Shaw, Verona Shaw, come on. She was in a movie called Mountains of the Moon. How did she went from that to this? It's beyond me. In case you don't know, um, that was a film with uh, Patrick Burgeon. And that's actually a great movie, which, I, which sadly I wish that that masterpiece could have done so well at the box office it could have been talked about even more too 
And we need a 4K already for that film as well. Mojo Nixon. Uh, yes, Mojo Nixon, the, which I guess originally they were going to get uh, Tom Waits, but he wasn't available. But he was the guy who actually sang his novelty song, Elvis is Everywhere. Yeah. But he's done a lot of uh, punk rock and other things. Uh, joining in with John Pfeiffer, Dana Kaminsky, Francesca P. Roberts, who I believe she was in, um, she was in a very short-lived series called Baby Talk, which was inspired by Look Who's Talking. Uh, I think we already established, yeah, this was basically a TV show that brought in the popularity of Talking Babies, and I know they had a hard time with this series. <laughs> And I think she's been in other stuff, too. Um, Janani uh, Russell. Uh, Janani Russo. Who, of course, uh, w was best known for playing um, Carlo Rizzi in The Godfather. How did he went from that to this is beyond me. <laughs> Don Lake. Lance Heverson. Lance Heverson? was in this too yeah that's a shock that's a that's a big shocker because Lance Harrison that same year was actually in an awesome movie called uh, Hard Target yeah now that's a way better film that can kick more ass than this trash ever would and he played an awesome villain too <laughs> okay <laughs> That's a shocker he was in this mess. And, and even he couldn't be safe. Frank Welker, our legendary voice god himself. And Dan Casalanenta, yes, our Homer Simpson. Hard to believe they got him. Yeah, it's written by free writers. Yes, free writers who can't come up with, with jack shit. Parker Bennett, Terry Ronte, and Ed Solomon, um, based on the popular Mario games from Nintendo, and it's directed by two music video directors, and I'm not so sure if there are a couple for sure, but they might as well be, um, Rocky Morton and Annabelle Jinko, and for those who don't know, they were the creators of Max Headroom. That's right, Max Headroom. I love Max Headroom. Even growing up in the 80s, too, I love Max Headroom with Matt Feuer playing the role. You know, he's a comedian, but he always, you know, he's basically an AI himself that's created. And he, he basically just, you know, does his own thing, you know. It's amazing that they went from that to this. And they were also music video directors, too, because they've done a lot of uh, music videos from all of these many artists, even those new wave bands that we had at the time. What a shocker. And they came up with this mess. And I guess it kind of makes sense, though, because, you know, Koopa in this movie looks like exactly like Max Hedman in a way but it has a blend of Donald Trump in there too yeah, heaven forbid on that guy yes there's gonna be spoilers who cares even after 30 years ago it sucked in and it sucks now deal with it anyway here goes nothing the movie begins following the impact of the meteorite that hit Earth 65 million ago, which wiped out all the dinosaurs into extinction, all turned into fossils, of course. But there's one secret behind this, was that there's a universe that splits apart two parallel dimensions where all the surviving dinosaurs that didn't get hit 
had escaped into a new dimension that evolves into a humanoid race and they founded um, their own version of Manhattan, New York, simply called Dinohattan, which it's all filled with fungus around here and there. You know, it's a metropolis, it's a metropolis world that's now soon to be run by Mr. King Koopa, which of course he'll be known simply as President Koopa, played by Dennis Hopper. And of course, it would happen by 1973 when an abandoned mother had sent her child to a Catholic orphanage, which reveals a large egg and a rock that would soon be used as a necklace for this child. And then soon this abandoned mother has been killed by Koopa himself. And now the egg had just hatched into a human baby girl, which will soon be known as Daisy. Who of course would be played by Samantha Mathis will be the princess and also an archaeologist. Yeah, I said paleologist uh, earlier too. Well, it's kind of confusing too. I mean, I kind of got mixed up because, you know, the way things are going. I mean, this movie really messes you up so bad. You wouldn't believe it. Yeah, so I'm, I apologize for that one. Okay. But we all make mistakes. This, I mean, come on, this movie sucks so bad, it does does make you feel really dazed and all. Boy, Dazed and Confused is a better movie than this trash. <laughs> okay, okay, yes, that's another one I got to mention. But it does make me dazed and confused already having to deal with this. And yeah, more stronger than drugs. Which, I guess that's the case. <laughs> oh, God. Anyway, 20 years later, which would have been 1993, yeah, which was at the present time, we meet the Italian-American brothers themselves, Mario Mario and Luigi Mario, both played by Bob Hoskins and John Leguizamo. They're working together in the plumbing business, you know, getting ready to fix all these... Um, terrible drain pipes going around here and there from all the employees uh, for all the customers around but they're being close to driven out of business in a competition a very strict one by a mafioso named Anthony Scapelli who's played by Janani Russo and they own their own construction company too which they actually hired a lot of amateurs to destroy their business by actually just actually bursting out all these um, drain pipes here and there um, at the Brooklyn Bridge um, through this landscape around full of construction which also can lead to archaeology as we speak you know since now you know, Daisy is indeed an NYU archaeology student over there. But that's where Luigi met her. It was love at first sight, uh, especially when he was using the phone, just calling uh, for the this one uh, customer that they're going to be on their way to fix all their plumbing problems because they got all their tools and everything involved and they had the entire band, so they're going to show up. However, their band suddenly um, broke down and, and Mario was ready to fix it, trying to get some water to, to pour in and hoping that you know, the engine's going to work just fine. But it turns out they had to use Evian, the tall water bottle that's only $3. <laughs> but I guess that would do, since they couldn't use any tap water. So anyway, um, Luigi invited um, Daisy for dinner at 6 o'clock at the Italian restaurant, uh, joining in with Mario's girlfriend, 
Danella, played by Danny, Dana Kaminsky. So, anyway, Daisy was just showing him that she's been um, a back eradicating for dinosaur bones around, you know, discovering of all these other dinosaurs that's, they're all fossils for sure, around the Brooklyn Bridge. But then, after dinner, they witnessed Capelli's man sabotaging by leaving the water pipes open, and both Mario and Luigi had attempted to fix it, but then we meet the Koopas, uh, henchmen and cousins, Iggy and Spike, uh, both played by Fisher Stevens and Richard Edson. Yes, Iggy Koopa and Spike Koopa. And they were, and since they're now the leader of, since Koopa is indeed the leader of the other dimension as we speak, they eventually kidnap Daisy they knocked uh, both Mario and Luigi out, but they woke enough for sure. And um, they also accidentally, mistakenly uh, kidnap all the other girls around. And that includes Mario's girlfriend, Danella. So the brothers have pursued them through an interdimension portal to Dino Hatton. Yes. It, it goes straight into the solid rock where you get to see the face and that's where they somehow enter straight into and that's how you see the the dimension warp here and there you know flying around floating around and that's where they wind up straight into the portal of Dino Hatton but they lost track of Daisy and once they spotted them because um, they also took the rock from her. Yeah, they ripped it out out of her out of her necklace. It would soon be stolen by Big Bertha, who was played by Francesca P. Roberts, who happens to be the bouncer of the Boom Boom Bar. And Dino Haddon just seems like totally corrupt as it seems. I mean, everyone's like acting so so shallow so antagonistic and all that i mean everyone just acted so weird and even the the police you know, all all the cops around are so are so full of it they're they're all very tough badass guys and, and they actually captured both mario and luigi uh, straight into the police station and yes they did reveal their names even though it almost plays exactly like something out of uh, an Albert and Costello joke. Yeah, but in, you know, like the who's on first joke. I mean, that gets, <laughs> that's so hilarious to this day. That, you know, it does confuse everyone's minds around. I mean, that's what makes it so clever and funny is that they're trying to figure out who's on first, what's on second, and who's on third uh, the of the baseball base around here and there you know the home plate and all that I mean yeah you get the idea still <laughs> okay so anyway um, they were sent to prison for sure but that's where they meet uh, Koopa or they thought you know he's some someone else but turned out yeah he is Koopa himself and um, basically, um, they're about to escape because uh, just earlier they just met Toad. Yes, we actually have Toad in the movie, and he's played by Mojo Nixon. But this is not the Toad we all know from the games and the Super Show, as well as all the other Mario cartoons. Yeah, who's the mushroom guy? No, this Toad is basically a musician. You know, he plays the guitar. Uh, he even plays the harmonica. Yes, he's basically just a rock singer. But sort of like a homeless type of uh, rock singer too. 
So they all got sent to prison for sure. And at that point on, um, yeah, because he's a guitarist too. Um, we've been getting to find out that Toad would later wound up straight into this one big um, transformation machine where you can change the dial to like, you're going to love this, uh, one through Cretaceous or or Jurassic or any other kind. And, e and yes, you can actually t take uh, two dumb kids or dumb guys into... Uh, into more smarter and clever ones. See, they even have a machine for that to change on the dial. Well, they just turned uh, Toad into a Goomba. Yes, the Goombas look exactly, basically small-headed, uh, lizard-like uh, creatures, but they all have, they basically have bigger bodies. Yeah, small, a tiny head, but bigger bodies. What is this? <laughs> I know. Pretty dumb, isn't it? Well, at least he's the only good Goomba we ever got. While the rest is just bad. And then there's other kinds of Goombas, too. Like, I think there's... Yeah, there's also supposed to be the... The, the tortoise ones. You know, the, the troopas, as they call them. And this is the best they can come up with. I just... I couldn't believe I was amazed when I saw this at, as an 8-year-old. And even seeing it now, too, is just amazing how stupid it is. Well, anyway, they, they're about to escape. Um, they just knocked out all the other cops and stuff, and they even knocked out Koopa, and they just sent him straight into that machine. And they and Mario just uh, switched the dial to Cretaceous, and that's when we begin to find out that, yes, indeed, Koopa is part human, part creature. And that's where he screams, I'll kill those plumbers! <laughs> so yes, both Mario and Luigi has stole the police car, and they're on a big chase here and there. And then there's even a reward that where it just shows like um, a poster that says that they're aliens. Yeah, alien plumbers. And they even said, well, you look ugly. You don't look so bad yourself. And they're explaining, aliens? Who are aliens? And, and they're saying, we're the aliens. And Luigi just says, oh, wow, cool. <laughs> While they're continuing on the chase, they somehow fell all the way down into the pit until they're being saved by a huge load of fungus. So yes, the fungus saved their lives, even though they fought, you know, Mario fought, even though Mario fought that he saved their own lives, if that was the case, even though, <laughs> even though they weren't so sure if they're very good at driving here and there with a collision course, <laughs> as they're making. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Meanwhile, Daisy just learns that she is a descendant from the dinosaurs, from a long-lost princess of the other dimension. Her father, who happens to be played by, you're going to love this, Lance Hamerson as the king, yeah, the real king, was overthrown by Koopa and her mother, which is the queen. We also learned that uh, Koopa actually has a jealous girlfriend named Lena, who's played by Fiona Shaw. Yes, and she basically wants to steal the rock and also try to see, checking out all the girls around that are being trapped inside this one entire room. So, basically she told the truth about Daisy. Uh, next thing you know, um, Izzy and Spike have realized that they lost Daisy's rock, which is, of course, the meteorite fragment that Koopa needs to merge both worlds together. I guess they can't use the Superstar, like in the new movie. But 
only to believe that Daisy is the only heritage to to solve this. So anyway, uh, once Mario and Luigi had already escaped to, to rescue uh, Daisy as they continue, and also to aid by Toad, because even Toad's been captured, um, Daisy's own escape attempt was to be aided by, you're going to love this, Yoshi. And Yoshi is basically a tiny T-Rex. I mean, he looks very really cute, I'll give you that, but that's our Yoshi, our, our, our tiny T-Rex that we got. I know. They should have done so much better. And this is what we get. But anyway, he is indeed a cute pet from the royal family of Iggy's and Spikes. Which, I know they now became intelligent already. And they're going on the search to find the meteorite. But, they got caught by Mario and Luigi down at the pits. Which, at this rate, they were at the desert. Yeah, they're like running, walking around, running around, trying to find Daisy. Uh, well, while Lena was trying to unsess was trying her best to to kill Daisy unsuccessfully though and was ready to obtain the rock for sure because she's going to be able to use that rock to as we speak for that diabolical plan was to do exactly what Koopa would wanted to do you know involve two worlds So that kind of leads to another chase here and there, and then the, and both Mario and Luigi are ready to, to actually go after a Big Bounce, uh, Big Burfa, at the Boom Boom Bar. Yes, because in order to get the meteorite that she's wearing as a necklace uh, to her that she stole, and she actually has this. Uh, this jump pack, yes, one of those um, jet kind of packs uh, that's coming from the boots, and it so she just flies off here and there once once they jump. Anyway, um, there's a scene in the movie where both uh, Luigi was and Mario, of course, together. Just we're at the elevator and they're just about to like move around those Goombas and. And those the troopas, you know, because they had that elevator music being played and just to distract them while they escape. Um, anyway, they also went to the Boom Boom Bar. And they were about to meet Big Burfa again. Um, Mario was trying to distract her, you know, just do like a bit of a dance here and there while stealing the, the meteorite necklace out of her. I mean, he actually got knocked out, too. Yeah, he got punched at first, and then then he just continues. <laughs> but then later on, they, they continue their, their escape by using those, uh, those jump packs. Yeah, so now they can be able to jump their way out. And yes, they also did wear their costumes. You know, they're all overall, overalls, and, you know, both the red and... And the green um, clothes that they had, you know, try to match exactly what the Mario Brothers look like. And they're about to go ready to stop Koopa, who was about to order pizza while during their, you know, mission right here, during the battle. Uh, meanwhile, you know, while Lena's already, you know, got caught by Koopa and the rest of his uh, police force. They still, yes, he now has the meteorite rock, which will later be stole again. Or at this rate, during the battle scene be between Mario and, and Koopa, because it turns out Lena did took the the meteorite once again. Uh, well. Well, Luigi was with um, Daisy, you know, trying to stop her. Yes, she did try the, the meteorite. She put it on 
down straight to her fingers. Yeah, she that she took the meteorite and just put it inside this one particular um, this one entire solid rock place. So that's where the dimensions are going to switch place here and there. But it didn't work for her because she got killed and became well, a skeleton, a fossil. <laughs> So now they got to try to, um, they're trying to fix this dimension going around, which then leads to merging. Because now both, um, well, we did learn about that Mario does have the bomb. Yeah, the bomb. The tiny bomb. And it actually has Rebox. <laughs> Product placement right there. So, yes, he used the bomb, you know, to, uh, to Koopa and also he started to use uh, well he, he was trying to fool uh, Koopa into thinking he had the, the rock but he doesn't but then suddenly both of them had disintegrated they're going straight into Brooklyn so, so they're merging together and then suddenly they want up straight to Brooklyn and then they with Koopa's uh, blasted um, transformation gun that he has yeah just shooting all both Mario and Luigi here and there as they're jumping around on their jump packs here and there around the entire city uh, actually well I guess that happened later too um, that's where we had Scapelli around and soon he'll be transformed into a chimpanzee <laughs> once he accidentally got shot you know, by the, uh, the laser gun that transforms. Yeah, it's the laser gun, I guess. So now, uh, they went back to Dino Hanton as they continue their, their last fight. And then finally, by the time it ends, you know, they finally defeat Koopa, going straight into that pit. He then turned into... The dino creature as we expected to see and boy that was a very short scene right there like only a, a few seconds we only get to see him appear but then both Mario and, and Luigi together used the the laser gun and and destroyed uh, Koopa for sure so now he finally evaporated and disappeared no more Koopa so now, everything went back to normal, but Daisy, unfortunately, has to save everyone around. And, and then we also learned about that um, her father, who's the king, yes, she's, he's already been covered by, you know, fungus. I mean, he turned into this gooey slime fungus who, that was underneath the, uh, the warp zone pipe. Was he well, through the world? And he has, of course, a world chair, too. And I know Yoshi also saved Daisy's life as well. And not to mention, Mario did save the rest of the missing girls that they captured, along with Danella. So they all escaped straight into this one big uh, pipe, uh, or at this rate, the air vent pipe. Yeah, it's all, you know frozen and solid and all that so they escape through the mattress all the way through yeah I, I know I'm going back and forth on this but you, you know what I mean and afterwards um, but now going forward backwards here or forwards here oh I messed up here well, now uh, the king had finally went back to normal and just turned into Lance Everson <laughs> as the king. So now the entire city is back to its place, and now Daisy's going to fix all this stuff for sure. So Daisy decided not to come back to their world, which is Brooklyn, until everything gets solved. So now Luigi's going to miss her. So now, both Mario and Luigi are back in Brooklyn, and they're still getting ready for their business. 
and they're probably going to put away Scapelli and all the rest of their amateurist team. So, however, they are about to find out about just a few weeks ago to see how the reports go. And then, it turns out Daisy was back getting ready for their next mission. Yes, which is basically a sequel bait ending. And guess what it follows after that? You know, through the credits. Yes, they even got the post credits as well. Where I think that might be the creator of Mario and the president of Nintendo together, um, which they're about to get him ready for their next game for both Iggy and and Spike. I'm like, come on, guys. You can do better than this. Oh. Yep. This movie can kiss my ass. <laughs> I, I, you know, I hated it then and I hated it now. And it sure wasn't worth, you know, my time. And I'm already wasting it already. <sighs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to say this. The cast could have done so much better as they should have been. I mean, it's such a waste of a cast right here. They're very talented people. I know they tried so hard on this one, and I know they did. But it's just... It's just too bad, you know, they could have done everything to save this mess. I mean, Bob Hoskins himself hated this movie so much. Even originally, he didn't even want to do this. Because he said he already did Hook, and he already did Two Frame Roger Rabbit, so what was the point of that? But because they gave him a revised script, he figured he says, okay, I'll do it. But even looking back at it before he passed away, he still hated the movie, and I don't blame him. John Leguizamo, on the other hand, eventually, I guess in some cases, defended it somehow. Because he... he I, and you wouldn't believe this because he ends up uh, criticizing the new Super Mario Brothers movie by saying it has no diversity. I mean, wow, 30 years later, you know, after that terrible mess that he, he has been in, and he's getting better as an actor as we speak as it follows, he has the nerve to say about the Super Mario Brothers movie, about diversity. I mean, come on, man. If I were him, I, I would just say, good luck. You know, I'm glad you made an excellent movie that respects um, the video games because I didn't know what I was thinking when I was in this. That's what he could have said. And I find it funny, though, because um, one of the stars uh, in Super Mario Bros. movie, uh, which happens to do the voice of Princess Peach, uh, Anya Taylor-Joy, was actually... In a movie with John Lucasama recently called The Menu. So, <laughs> he should talk about diversity. You know, I'm, I'm getting tired of, of this woke agenda crap that we have to, that everything has to be forced into in this dumbed down generation. And frankly, I, this needs to stop. It really does. <sighs> Yeah, and it's really sad, too, because Dennis Hopper is always terrific as villains, you know, especially when he played Frank Booth in Blue Velvet. I mean, his character was more terrifying than ever before. And it seems like he's pretty much doing his Frank Booth uh, persona in this movie, but only to blend in with Max Headroom and Donald Trump in there, for sure. And it, it, what a waste of performance, because he, he would have been a terrific villain. He should have, he could have been, or should have been. But, again, that's the best they can do, I guess. I mean, and Samantha Mathis is cute. I mean, beautiful, vulnerable, for sure. You know, I, I had no problem with her in the movie. And we also learned that, you know, her mother, she also played the queen, too, the mother. Um, Fisher Stevens and Richard Edson, I mean, yeah, that, they're basically just plain 
the, the cousins of of the Koopas, and I know they're doing what they can, but you know these are two great actors, funny and all, but they're totally wasted also. And that goes the same with Fiona Shaw too, and Mojo Nixon, Francesca P. Roberts, and and all the rest of the actors, even the Lance Heverson. Don Lake was in this too, and I know Don Lake's been in a lot of stuff. I mean, if you know who that actor is. Um, wow, and, and what a waste of um, voice actors of Frank Welker and Dan Castellaneta. And yes, because he does the voice of Yoshi and the Goombas. Well, they got to pay the bills somehow. <laughs> oh, and wow, I mean, I, I know they were trying to to follow in into the success of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles films where we had the live action versions of them and I, I can see why they were doing that because they wanted to see how how successful it's going to be you know after we had the games but they totally blew it they didn't do the research properly it did no justice to the story whatsoever I mean I don't know why they had to come up with this lame brain story about you know dinosaurs and they turn into a, a different dimension here and there I mean that just seems you know and I couldn't believe it myself it just seems rather lame and dumb and potentially awful <laughs> if I could come up with some smart words to say <sighs> well what can you do um, and the sad part about this, though, the soundtrack was excellent. I mean, a lot of bad films definitely get excellent soundtracks, and this is one of them. They had a song called Almost Unreal by Roxette, which I know the lead singer passed away um, a long time ago, and it's sad because, you know, she was terrific. Yeah, they, they were a duo group. And they sing a lot of great songs, like um, She's Got the Look, or simply the look as they call it and there's also the song um, it must have been love by from the movie uh, pretty woman and also she's saying the song uh, listen to your heart or even which would later be covered uh, and then late then there's the song called um, if I can remember um, dress for success yeah <laughs> A lot of great songs, but sadly, it had to be on this movie. Oh, and speaking of which, uh, there was even a song called Walk the Dinosaur, which happens to be the cover version by George Clinton. And because the original song was done by Was Not Was. Yeah, you know how the song goes. Open the door, get on the floor. Everybody walk the dinosaur. Open the door, get on the floor. Everybody walk the dinosaur. I love that song. Um, the cover version was alright, though. I mean, I still love the original song because I heard that song in the movie The Dream Team with Michael Keaton, along with Christopher Lloyd, Stephen First, and, um, and what's his name? <laughs> And so on. That was a very, that was a very funny comedy, and better than this mess that I'm watching. <laughs> uh, okay, I do admit that the special effects were pretty impressive at the time, even for the '90s. I mean, yes, the practical effects uh, looked neat, and even the special effects. So they did use some CGI effects on the uh, the solid walk scene of the dimension that they had. And all this other stuff that they put into it. But that doesn't mean the movie is any good at all. I mean, all this fungus here and there. The bouncy fungus around. Trust the fungus. I mean, come on. And the fact that they had the mushroom and other surprises. Instead of using the blocks that they're supposed to have. And all these other obstacles that we're supposed to have too in the movie. And everything that's supposed to be in the movie. I mean, come on, is this the best they can come up with with all this stuff? 
all this technology that they had to work so hard on and having to build all the sets. I mean, they had David L. Snyder, who of course is the uh, the art director of a Blade Runner, would come up with something this dark and gloomy and more skillful than ever for this giant set. I mean, it's just sad that all this talent is all wasted into this mess of a movie. And they obviously don't know how to do anything that was presented. And I was kind of amazed that um, Roland Joffrey, the man who gave us uh, the Killing Fields, as well as the Mission and City of Joy, was developed to have the script. In fact, I think he was originally going to direct this, but he, he dropped out. But I'm just amazed that the screenwriters was going to come up with something that's in the tradition of The Wizard of Oz and Ghostbusters. I mean, yeah, two better movies. And they always, and because, you know, you have the creators of Max Headroom, they thought, okay, let's, let's have a villain of Koopa to make him look like one. Um, and then, of course, they were also going to get other directors to do the parts, too. And they were also going to get other different screenwriters. And, boy, even having to read some back history behind this before this whole thing happened. Did, did you know that they actually were going to get, and you're going to love this, but they were originally going to get Danny DeVito to play Mario, and that would have been awesome. I would have loved to see him as Mario, because he's about the right size for that. And they were actually going to get Dustin Hoffman to... And also, they were going to cast Dustin Hoffman to play one, too, which I couldn't see that. I mean, maybe Luigi, yes, but not, not Mario. And then I heard they were going to get Tom Hanks to play Mar uh, Luigi, sorry. Luigi, um, but because of his uh, strain of recent box office failures, um, they couldn't accept it. I mean, that's that's stupid, because I know he was doing some Disney movies for a while, like Turner and Hooch. And yes, they were also going to get Arnold Schwarzenegger or even Michael Keaton to play Koopa. And if they were going to, I think they probably would have played them in a more different way, like they, they could have been more humanoid. But I'm just glad that they didn't got the role because I think that would probably suck. And and maybe I don't blame them too. <laughs> because already Schwarzenegger did uh, waste his talent in Batman and Robin as playing Mr. Freeze. So there you go. And Michael Keaton also wasted his talent for playing the villain in the Robocop uh, re yeah, reboot, which is I know Robocop. From 2014 or 2014. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. Put that aside of the effects. I mean, it just seems like we're running out of quarters right here, too. I mean, all, all that just went completely out of the oblivion. There were plenty of bad scenes in this movie, plenty of prophetic and stupid scenes. I mean, Having to use the fungus as your own savior is just a pretty nasty thought. It almost makes me feel like I would rather be trusting my own illness right there. Ugh. Even I don't want to think about that. It's also nasty, disgusting. They just can't do the story any justice through its source material yet alone the video games themselves. They're just trying to make it look bad. And that's not fair, because video games are a big piece of art, and they have an excellent story to tell, even though you're playing the game um, as your own perspective. And Yes, there's even more lame scenes, like, of course, the one where Mario had to bounce on this one where he fell all the way down into this big, giant fungus and bouncing off like a trampoline while Luigi was hanging around, which turned out to be a hook. Like, you thought he was floating around, but he's not. Yeah. Or exactly the truth about you know, Daisy's um, 
identity and all that. I mean, there's just a lot of things wrong with this film. So, we can't even have a Mushroom Kingdom. We can't even have uh, all these other lands involved. We can't even have Peach. We can't even have the actual Bowser. The real villain, as we all know. We can't even have the entire Koopa clan that's done right. We can't even have an actual war. Or any other. Oh. Nothing. Most of all, it's hardly funny. The humor was just incredibly cringe-inducing. I mean, okay, maybe I did laugh a few. I, I, I admit on that level, but but nothing could be safe. I mean, it's hard to believe Disney's uh, Hollywood Pictures uh, subsidiary would actually make this mess. Uh, joining in with um, Light Motive and Ally Filmmakers. Um, because they just had a free license for Nintendo to produce. They didn't produce this movie, though, sadly. But it had they had, you know, they could have done so well. I mean, it's a, and plus, the, the soundtrack was done by Alan Silvestri, out of all people, who did the soundtrack for Back to the Future. And then they get um, Mark Goldblatt during, during the editing for this film, and... Dean Summoner doing the cinematography. Well, I mean, you can definitely see a lot of things going wrong. I mean, it's too bad they didn't have the Mushroom Kingdom or any other kinds of lands that they went for to get this movie exactly portrayed just right. I'll just be glad they didn't have the song for Daisy where Koopa ends up singing his love for her. If that, if that was the case, but I doubt it. If I was saying, Daisy, 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 I love you. Ah, whatever. I sound stupid. Ah, okay. And the movie got a Blu-ray release overseas, which at this rate... A special edition release in Germany. Yes. So people can waste their hard-earned cash on importing this mess. Because it has an, a new HD print. Remastered digitally. Meanwhile, we're stuck with the North American DVD release that's... That's just... Looks really terrible on the format. But that's probably the only thing we'll ever get to see it on. <laughs> and you have to buy it for five bucks at, at your local Walmart. Or maybe for or maybe two dollars even. If you have to dig deeper to the bargain bins. <laughs> Whatever. You know, that, that probably costs enough for the same ticket price when when you saw it back in ninety three. Whatever. It just stay buried down to the hatchet. Anyway, I'm just glad people did say, especially truer Mario fans right there said, this definitely disclaimed that it's one of the worst movies of all time, and rightly so, because it is indeed one of the worst movies of 1993. In fact, it's my number one worst movie of 1993 for sure. Uh, joining in, or no, or I guess at this rate, it's, it's joining in with uh, The Good Son, because I still hated that film to death. So yes, it joins in with the Super Mario Bros. movie, because as a child who loves Mario, that goes the same with my brother Jason. I mean, we all felt disappointed. We felt wasted. You know, just to make us feel better, we went to Round Table Pizza in Burbank, you know, just to have a nice, delicious pepperoni pizza with sausage and green peppers and a nice cold Pepsi to go with it while we're watching, um, you know, cable TV 
yeah, like Nickelodeon or all these other channels. And um, I think we were also watching The Simpsons too because it was a Sunday that day. And um, before we were watching other stuff too. And then we were also playing video games because yes, they had the they had the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game, they had the Simpsons game, they had all these other stuff. Oh, and the Neo Geo. If anybody remember Neo Geo, yeah, they had a lot of those other games that they got. So it was really cool. Yeah, and boy, do I miss that round table in Burbank before it became Big Mamas and Papas Pizzeria. Yeah. Man, those were the days. It's just too bad we could have had a better Super Mario Brothers movie that year alone. Why can't it just be like the one that we got today? I just don't understand. I mean, the fact that we couldn't get Princess Peach or Toadstool, the, and we could have had Mario and Luigi, you know, going into their own different uh, dimensions here and there and, and fight against Koopa in a whole different way. I mean, if you ask me, they could have just done the animated feature instead. That's what they should have done. They should have just done an animated feature when it came out during Memorial Day weekend. See, that's where they they failed on so many levels. But I understand. They had to go for live action because that's where the big bucks goes. And if Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles can make it big, even with Batman and and other superhero films coming around and so could this one, but it didn't. It bombed very badly. Um, out of its uh, 42 to 48 million dollars, wow, you can see that uh, all wasted on the screen. I mean, where all the money went, straight to the toilet, it only made 38.9 million. <laughs> wow, what a waste. I really hate this movie so much, and I, I was so embarrassed with regression and disappointed, and I, I really felt bad for my parents too, and I felt bad for everyone, and I felt bad for myself to drag them into it. I wish just, I hate that horrible experience, and I'm just glad that's over with. End of story. So that's Super Mario Brothers, the live action abomination from 1993, and I give that film zero fucking stars. And it's not superstars either. I'm Joseph A. Sabora. I'll see you later, much later. Bye.